Hello and welcome to One and One. I am Cyril Stover. One of the key programs of the administration is to grow the economy. Now in outlining its plans for the Nigerian economy, the Buhari government committed to diversification, moving away from the near total dependence on oil, creating jobs and ensuring food security. Agriculture, recognized as one area with the potential for the creation of millions of jobs, expectedly is being targeted. But old practices must give way to progressive ideas in order to achieve increased agricultural productivity, sustainable agricultural growth, and wealth creation. Now, one institution is dedicated to the development, collation, evaluation, and dissemination of proven agricultural innovations and research and extension services and policy. The National Agricultural Extension and Research Liaison Services is one of 18 national agricultural research institutes under the Federal Ministry of Agriculture and Rural Development. Today, I'm sitting with its chief executive, that's the executive director and chief executive officer, Muhammad Khalid Uthman. He is a professor of agricultural engineering of Ahmadu Bello University, Zaria, where he teaches and supervises undergraduate and postgraduate students. He has more than 80 articles in reputable academic journals, conference proceedings, and extension publications. He's held numerous management positions, including director of Ahmadu Bello University Consultancy Services, and has participated in many research works in the last two decades. Let's welcome Professor Khalid Othman. Thank you for being here. Thank you very much. It's my pleasure meeting you, Sidney Stover. All right, okay. So, we talk about um, N-A-E-R-L-S. That's a long one, a National Agricultural <laughs> Extension and Research Liaison Services. Yes, and research. Liaison Services Limited, and uh, it's all about uh, agricultural extension services. So let's first of all situate what extension services mean. Well, uh, thank you very much. Uh, agricultural extension is a scientific uh, application uh, of approach to disseminate, uh, to package and disseminate agricultural innovations and knowledge from where it has been developed. Uh, to where it is to be used, and it also involves, uh, you know, taking the feedback from the users to where the extent, where the, uh, the innovations or technologies that were developed, uh, to see, you know, whether the developed technology is actually, you know, uh, uh, meeting the, the the targets and is doing what it's supposed to be doing, and then uh, it all involves the pharmacy education. Uh, for the different uh, improved agricultural practices uh, in any commodity along the value chain. Uh, that is, uh, if you take one particular commodity, like uh, maize or rice or any of them, uh, from planting to processing to preservation up to, you know, utilization, uh, that is what it means by extension. Right, so when you mention knowledge, skills, and the rest of them, so some of this might well be local, some maybe universal uh, innovations which uh, we get from other parts of the world, but you, you, you can also develop local technologies and uh, local knowledge. Exactly, local. exactly. Right. Yeah, uh, it, it is true that uh, local knowledge is also being utilized uh, because uh, that's why we talk about innovation. Uh, the innovation does not necessarily that somebody has to go to university and get all the degrees. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's something to do with creativity, 
and uh, once it is tested and is working and is uh, you know it increases productivity then it is adapted so uh, I nowadays with the ICT you see the knowledge is you know the whole world is a global village and we find that uh, wherever there is innovation anywhere uh, it can be adapted uh, to suit your, your environment but you know in extension also you have to look take into consideration the cultural value of the people that are going to adopt the technology. So right, like, let's situate this in Nigeria, for yeah. instance. You have a farming population that is largely restricted to the rural areas, and uh, except for recent developments, most are just considered rural folks with little or no uh, exposure to modern farming techniques and uh, such innovation. So what difference can extension make to these crop of people, one, and two, uh, increased productivity generally? Actually, mainly extension is even more focused on the rural uh, population because you can see uh, most of the farming uh, population live in the rural areas. So uh, really, you know, in the past, we used to have the ADP system that is, even though after today, the ADP system is still there, but it was more effective maybe 20 or 30 years ago. And uh, in those days, people could easily see extension agents uh, going to the villages and, uh, you know, towns and so on. But these days, hardly you can see them. And those extension agents are the people that are taking the technology that have been developed by the various research institutes and universities and that have also been validated to be uh, seen to be proven technologies uh, to, to these rural populations. And the populations uh, also adopt such technology. And then also the same extension agent has also take feedback. So there are several platforms uh, that, you know, this feedbacks are being tabled and people experts come together uh, you know the the, the the scientists the extension agents uh, the extension personnel the technocrats and so on and come together to sit down and look at the feedback and look at the technology so there are various uh, platforms right prof we would never tire of asking the same question yeah. and you just mentioned it a while ago that um, the ADPs some 30 or so years ago were more effective and it was under them that the populace came to identify more with extension services workers. Now, seeing that this was key to improved and increased agricultural productivity, what happened? Thank you very much for this very, very important question. Actually, uh, the ADP system the 30 years ago was working very well. And the ADP system was introduced by the World Bank, and it was act uh, actively being supported by the World Bank Fund. Uh, that was in, in the 70s. Uh, it started with a uh, Funtua Agriculture Development Project, uh, Guso Agriculture Project, and then Gombe Agriculture Project. And uh, today, uh, there are 37 ADPs, yeah, one per state uh, plus FCC. But unfortunately, uh, hardly people can see the effect of these ADPs. Uh, because there are several issues, several constraints. Uh, first of all, after the withdrawal or after the, the exhaustion of the, of, the, of, the, of the fund from the World Bank, uh, the ADPs uh, were transferred back. Although already they were their staff of the state and the state took over the ADPs activities and funding as well. But unfortunately, over the years, the ADPs have not been funding this, uh, ADP, uh, the states have not been funding these ADPs. And that has actually affected their, 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 their productivity. Uh, one, that system is called uh, TMV, uh, uh, you know, tra 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 uh, TMV training and visits. Mm. What it means is that, you know, the extension agent or personnel have to be consistently and constantly being trained. And then uh, he also has to visit, you know, one, one place to another and things like that. So the system quite all right requires a lot of fun. And unfortunately, the state governments over the years have not been, uh, you know, uh, providing the necessary fund for the ADPs to work. I can quickly give you an example. Uh, National Agriculture Extension and Social Service Services, where I am from, uh, NRLS, uh, we conduct uh, agricultural performance survey every year in the last 30 years. And what we do in the agricultural performance survey is to actually, you know, collate all agricultural resources that is being used within a particular season, for instance, during the wet season or during the dry season. The 2018 wet season that we collected uh, in the month of August and uh, September, uh, one of the results that we found 
In fact, up to the uh, uh, month of September, uh, 25 of the EDPs received zero allocation of their fund. And 33 of the EDPs also complained of inadequate staff. Meanwhile, 34 of the EDPs also you know, talk, uh, did not receive any capacity building for the last two years. So with this, you can you know, say that uh, the ADP system has almost collapsed. Uh, many of these staff are only seen to receive monthly salary, and unfortunately some of the ADPs are not even receiving the salary. So that is how bad the situation has been. So with such grim statistics, what would you say is the status of uh, extension services in Nigeria today? Yes. Uh, this extension service in Nigeria, honestly speaking, is ineffective. And why? One, there is you know, tremendous increase in population. If you may recall, in 1991, the population of Nigeria was about 100 million. Today, when I was coming here, I look at the old meters, which is a computer application that, you know, uh, a population, what is called population clocks of every country and the world. I read that the, the population is 200 million 634 at 11 o'clock today. So, and when you compare with even when Nigeria uh, got independence, when the population was just about 42 million, you can see that the population has increased more than five times. And every person needs food because uh, food is the most important and ingredient for any you know for the body to to to, to function so uh that is one on the other part like i mentioned with the poor funding of the edifice because it's the edp that is actually you know interacting interfacing with the farmers the users of the technology when they are you know poorly funded there's no way this technology can go to these users not to talk of even taking feedback from the users to the to the to to, to technology generators like the national uh, agricultural research institute so that is why we can you know say that the the, the extension services is very ineffective uh, it is there but it's not really serving the purpose that is uh, desired so let's bring in your uh Institute now, the National Agricultural Extension and Research Liaison Services. So how have you been able to bridge this gap or provide these services? Thank you very much. You see, uh, like I mentioned, oh well, uh, let me quickly say that NRLS is in between the National Agricultural Research Institute, Faculties of Agriculture, and the edifice. We take you know, the technology generated by these research institutes, validate the technology and package them and then disseminate to the edifice. We also lead in capacity building of the EDP personnel. These are two major roles in addition to the agricultural performance that we conduct every year to bring out the different agricultural resources available in this country, the input and so on, and as well as bring out the constraint. So, uh, in the last five years, or 10 years back, when we discovered that most of the things we are doing is not really reaching out to the farmers. So we have to think out of the box. What we first of all did is, okay, what do we do? And one major constraint we have is that NLS has less than 1,000 staff. As of today, we have about 700 staff. So these 700 staff cannot really, you know, service 70 million farmers. Mm -hmm. so, what we did, what we think of, okay, first is let us now create strategy that we can directly reach out, you know, uh, you know, uh, uh, at the same time, see how we can also mobilize the edifice with the, because the edifice still has, they have a lot of personnel. Right. So uh, we establish uh, what you call National Agricultural Pharmacy Supply Center. Uh, with the federal administration, we were very lucky that this National Agricultural Pharmacy Plan Center is today fully equipped and, and, and we have personnel that are there. And in addition to that, the Federal Ministry of Agriculture and Rural Development also established six zonal uh, health plan centers. Although those six zonal health plan centers are yet, are yet to be fully equipped, 
but at least they are at the different levels of you know uh, uh, development so the whole idea is to actually you know create a platform whereby farmers can easily reach to the centers and get necessary essential advisory services mm -hmm. and the center can also reach out to, 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 to the farmers and uh, uh, our center has about 30 computers and these 30 computers can be used simultaneously and with that we can we can reach out to up to five to six telephone calls uh, on the average of two minutes mm -hmm. and that means is a lot of services can be rendered with this national farmers helpline the second strategy is the establishment of adopted villages as of today we are working with about 30 thousand farmers across this nation and on daily basis this number of farmers is increasing and what we do what we mean by adopted village is that we go into the community when we go into the community we now you know in a participatory manner uh, organize the the, the the farmers in that community identify constraints of agriculture identify problems and also identify solutions together with these farmers at the end of the day we will now also bring solutions and like i mentioned it is a participatory manner the farmers also contribute in the funding of these services right so these are two key things that i want to dwell on a little longer yeah the helpline centers which you talked about and the adopted villages yeah now how do you carry these um innovations to make sure that they're sustainable one of the uh challenges um, that you can always point to in the past is that yeah. people who are supposed to benefit from certain programs and projects hardly ever adopt it and see it as their own. They say, oh, this is the project of the World Bank, this is the project of NERLS. And so, how do you convince the populace that it's not your program, but it's their program, so yes. that they can really adopt that? That is why I use a word participatory. As we enter into the village, first we we conduct baseline survey to assess the resources, agricultural resources in that community. Second is to bring the farmers together. We organize them in groups. So we bring the groups together. And we discuss issues of agriculture in a participatory manner. We allow the farmers to even lead hmm. while we right. make corrections here and there. Right. and make observations and bring some, you know, ex our experiences. At the end of the day, we will now identify issues that are really problems constraining agricultural productivity in that community. Mm. And they will also have to really see, yes, these are constraints. For instance, if somebody tell you that his major constraint in agriculture is fertilizer, right. you sit down with the farmer, you may end up no finding that this farmer does not even know how to apply fertilizer. So the first thing is access to fertilizer. The second thing is the skill, the knowledge. Because when you are going, when you are even, you know, moving on, on a car, you peep in, you see farmers applying fertilizer, you know that they don't know how to apply fertilizer. That more than 70% of the fertilizer that they are acquiring it's been lost in, so, in the so, form so of this is not just about so, access to so, it. You may so have the fertilizer, but you don't even know how to apply it. How to apply it. Exactly. Then we also talk about people say, no, we don't have fun. But you see, we need to make these farmers understand that farming is a business. When you are going into a business, you must have investment. Business requires investment. You don't take farming just because you want to eat food. No, you should make farming so that you eat food at the same time. You provide food to others and make money so that you can attend to other things. So that is one of the things. And then, like, you see, most of the people said, okay, uh, they have given loan to the farmers and they have not been able to, to, to repay back. I will, I'm telling you that in any release, in the last five years, we have disbursed, you know, uh, uh, loans up to maybe 200 million, and there was no single year we did not recover more than 90%. So oh. it is not true that farmers are not ready to pay. It all depends on how did you give, you, give them the money. So if you give them the money and show them that this is the dividend of democracy, so they will take it away. So these are old concepts which people have uh, refused to jettison. The mm. thought that 
you give the farmers loans you know it used to be the old you know concept they say give them loans and you hear things like oh they marry more wives or they do some other things like that these are concepts you say don't exist now exactly. people are looking for exactly all right we'll come to that the question of um, agri now a business yes and we'll look at some of the constraints which the rural folks would face in converting what otherwise they know subsistence farming into business but first let's look at what the input of this administration the Buhari government has been in the last four years in the first tenure of uh, the Buhari administration what would you say was the input since this administration has talked about diversifying the economy making sure that uh, agriculture would be used as they needed to to create many jobs what has been the input thank you very much for this question as well uh, I think I will just limit to about four or three or four inputs mm. the first part the first input is development of the green alternative which is agricultural promotion policy of 2016 to 2020 that policy has actually addressed the issue of rice mm. before the coming of this administration for instance in September 2015 the importation of rice was about 600,000 uh, 600, metric tons that were imported into this country. And within up to 2017, September, it was reduced to about 20,000 metric tons, which is quite, you know, the gap has been reduced. And the reason is that uh, there has been an establishment of 40 large uh, rice mills across this nation. In, so. And then it has also created more than 14,000 pounds of rice. So you can see that that is really a very big achievement and a very big input that has reduced the importation of rice. The second that I want to talk about is the issue of extension. Uh, in the social investment, the government has brought the empower you know, uh, uh, concept, the empower agro is very very big you know uh, achievement in the first in 2017 33,000 you know agro volunteers empower agro volunteers were employed by federal government and they were who, any less were responsible for training those 33 we trained them in all the in all the 774 local governments and this year 2019 over 100,000 Empower Agro were also brought into, uh, into the platform. And we similarly, we even improved the, the training manual, the, the parcelages. This one, that was even, you know, the, the iPad and so on. Because these were agricultural graduates. And all of them were brought into this platform. So that is a general intervention. This 103,000, I want to tell you that in the survey we conducted last year, we had we, we now discover that there are just about 14,000 ag ag uh, uh, extension agents in this country, 14,000. And meanwhile, in the last, you know, from 2017 to 2019, uh, government has employed 133,000, you know, uh, Empower Agro. So what it means is that it has actually been 10 times, almost 10 times, the existing extension personnel. And all of them came and they are, they, are, they are working. Some are working with the ADP, some are working with the ministry, some are working with even private sectors. And all of them, you know, were actually being, you know, given one, the, the, the necessary training so that they can be farmers on their own, they can also participate in extension services. So that is also a very important uh, thing that this government has brought in. Yes, we're going to talk about uh, some of them too. We have um, the agri pro uh, promotion programs, which uh, brought about uh, the uh, massive decrease in importation of rice. Mm. The Empower Agro, which has um, trained about 133,000 yes. uh, beneficiaries. Yeah, that's also third. Uh, I see how we're going to yes. mention third. The third one is the massive empowerment of youth and women. Uh, the Federal Ministry of Agri Agriculture and Development to rule the various national agricultural research institutes in the last two years have, you know, massively, you know, trained uh, uh, youth, especially unemployed youth and women, and empower them. Hmm. And several of these things, I think, are, 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 are you know, are, 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 they, are, they are all over this country. So 
that really, you know, has awakened a lot of people. Mm -hmm. And in, in addition to that, even NLS has actually organized several campaigns to make people understand that farming is a business, farming is, you know, especially in this era of un massive unemployment. And I, I, I assure that a lot of people have actually been going to the farm. So this brings us to some of the constraints we talked about in yeah. um, uh, moving over to the next level, as they say, that yeah. agri is now business. Funding is key to all of this, right? Yeah. And we did say one of the reasons why the uh, ADP has suffered in the past was um, a lack of funding. Yeah. Now, today's farmers who are beneficiaries of these innovations certainly at some point would require some form of funding. Access to credit, how easy is it these days, especially now that so much attention is on agriculture? Yeah, uh, truly, access to credit is very important. And uh, unfortunately, most of the commercial banks, when it comes to you know uh, giving out loans to the farmers, is always at high interest rate. And you see, farming, although it's been a business, you can get, you know, uh, you can invest one cobble and get 100 cobble. But at the same time, you can invest 100 kobo and get nothing. So it is a very risky business, but at the same time, uh, if you use knowledge, it is also very profitable. So most of the interest rate, especially being given by the, by the commercial banks, is quite, you know, uh, uh, you, you know, the interest is quite very high. And, and despite that, farmers continue to. So I think that's one area that I believe government council come in. We have to bring down the interest rate to less than ten percent so that farmers can have access to this credit and be able to pay it as at one do. And at the same time, you see uh, credit for agriculture is not like credit for other business whereby on monthly basis you continue to pay. In agriculture for instance in farming, when you invest, you are going to sell it at the end of all the right. time when it, the harvest has come. So it's a yeah. long gestation period. Yeah. So uh, it is not like the conventional that you have to be paying on a monthly basis. So th these are areas that we have a lot of concern. Even in, in uh, uh, the credit we have been given to our farmers, uh, we have been finding that issue very challenging. Mm. Because at the time that the gestation period is over, when the farmers are expected to pay back, you find that it is the, the harvest period. And the harvest period, the prices are always very low. So when they sell the, 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 their produce at that period, they, they will not be able to pay and get very large uh, in, uh, uh, profits. So that has been a, uh, an issue. Now let's return to the NPA Agro uh, program and their trainings. There's been talk about absorbing them completely into mainstream extension. What do you think about that? Yeah, it could be a very good idea. But like I mentioned, you see, uh, when we're talking about the effort being made by federal governments. We also need another effort from the state governments. Unfortunately, mm -hmm. it's not there. So the federal government has initiated Empower Agro, and many states can testify that the Empower Agro is a very good intervention and is, is doing very well. It is high time for the state governments to buy in this, th these programs and, 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 and engage this, 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 this Empower Agro. That's one. So uh, if that is done, I strongly believe that the agrarian productivity will double uh, uh, what it is today. Uh, Professor Othman, it's a, it's, it's, it's a recurring challenge, isn't mm. it? Um, policies, projects are enunciated at the federal level, but uh, the states hardly ever buy in. Is there something that can be done to change this, to turn this around? Well, you see, uh, we have operating federal system like government. That means that the state governments, uh, they have their own freedom to think and do what they are doing. But uh, I think there has to be a way that some programs that are being initiated by the federal government, the state government should buy in. And that is one, one key challenge, I, you know, it's not only in agriculture, in several other things, even in education, that some of the state governments may not actually buy in. But I think it is still part of, uh, you know, democratic growth. Maybe by the time we, we become mature democratically, mm -hmm. 
uh, when people will become accountable to the people that have put uh, uh, them in, I believe some of these things will naturally come in. But as of now, it's only very few states that, you know, look at this, uh, uh, this thing and things like that. All right, let's return to the issue of innovations and uh, knowledge, increasing the knowledge of farmers' innovations. And um, it's been said that one of the main reasons for low productivity in the agricultural sector is the near absence of the application of technology. That's true. So, so how can we cross this, you know, this hurdle? Yes. And again, we would also add to that and say, your extension uh, and research liaison services. services. How are you helping to address this challenge? Good. Uh, like I mentioned, uh, we are doing, you know. Uh, the issue of the farmers helpline that have brought into the the, the platform, we are also uh, you no know, looking the uh, the ideas of the other two villages, but of, uh, of course all these things may not be enough. The state government must actually come into the support of agriculture. You know, uh, when we talk about agriculture generally, uh, we are more doing the talking than the action. Uh, let me tell you that. Uh, you know, the investment of agriculture has been very long. The Mofoto Declaration, you know, which Nigeria is a signatory to it, recommended that budgets uh, to agriculture should be about 10%. Right. But, you know, uh, in the last many years, even before this administration, uh, government, both state and federal government, have never, you know, uh, you know invested up to 6%. Sometimes if it's even as low as 2%. And not only this budget, you know, being very low. The other major issue is the release of fund. Because time, agriculture is time-bound activity. When you're talking of planting, if you just miss one week, you see the difference. Because agriculture depends on climate, and climate is time-bound. It's issue of time. So you find that even to pass the, the budget, sometimes it's take up to the month of May. By May, some states have already started growing. Some, some, some states are almost even finishing the first you know, cycle of growing, and they're going to the second cycle. Then after passing the budget, and then the release. The release is very important. So we, when we talk even the little that we're investing, mm. we must also release it timely. If we release it timely, I believe it will increase, it will make impact on agriculture. Because even the loan that you know, farmers are also enjoying, especially commercial banks and other banks. You find that they receive this loan very late. And when you receive this loan, when a particular operation or some set of operations are passed, then the money will no longer be used for that particular, you know, farming. So the issue is that in this country, we must really understand and we must put people who know that, look, agriculture is an audience. I want to say that Agriculture or food, which is actually responsible for the production of food, and which is also you know contributing to the achievement of food security. The food security is a very major you know uh, security issue that should be you know given a top priority, much more than any other thing. In fact, if someone is asked that whether to be to be killed by hunger or to be killed by by bullet bullet would take one's life in two minutes or less than that but if it is hunger it will take up to 70 days without dying but after five days you'll be out of cautious consciousness hmm. and and that means that you slow you know it's, it's going to be a slow death so it is it is the worst part of insecurity in, 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 to humanity in the adoption of technologies, which of course we have little access to, would it be attitudes um, not really being receptive on the part of the farmers? Or we're looking here at the cost, because when you talk of foreign technologies, for instance, um, again the question of funding would come in. What about the adoption and development of local, of technology. local technologies? Thank you very much. You see, 
like you mentioned, there are 18 agricultural research institutes. And each of these 18 agricultural research institutes are fully engaged in you know, research to produce new technologies. And in addition to that, we have over 70 you know, faculties of agriculture. And in each of them, anybody going into, you know, uh, read to read agriculture must, if, must involve his, himself or herself into research. Whether it is a first degree, second degree, also you must actually participate in research. And this research, at the end of the day, is what brings out the technology that we're talking about. So there are several, and in fact, hundreds of thousands, you know, technology on shelf. And most of these technologies have never been used. They are still there and they have been produced by the, by the scientists and they are there on shelf. So the whole issue is that there are challenges. The first challenge is the issue of how do you commercialize this technology? Right. Are, are, are the industry ready to take these technologies? That's one. Uh, or, or people are just more readily available to bring in you know, uh, technologies or machineries from outside. The, we have several local technologies that have been developed. Second, the issue of extension, like I mentioned. The extension is divided into what I may call upstream and downstream. The upstream is where NLS is located and so on and so forth. And the downstream is where the ADP is located. So the ADPs are, are not functional. They are in comatose. The, 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 in fact, most of the ADPs, some of the ADPs have I have visited an ADP that's only, uh, that has only two vehicles. The one for the PM the head of the, and the one that is moving around. How can you expect such ADP to work? And it's supposed to be servicing the farmers of that state. Yeah, so, so, so this is quite very difficult. That is why the adoption rate is very low. One, farmers are not aware of this technology. I'm telling you this, after tomorrow, several farmers are using their traditional method of of, of farming. I want to tell you this, an elite farmer that is a graduate whom I give, you know, seeds, improved seeds last year. This guy came and asked me, he didn't know the name of the seeds. So that means that people must be very, very serious on agriculture so that whatever you are doing, you must have knowledge. Speaking of research and research findings and development of new technologies, What's the role of the private sector here? You say there are so many results lying there, and how to commercialize them. So is there no form of partnership? Or why would the private sector shy away from things like this? And yet the private sector will put huge sums Teamwork. into things that uh, many Nigerians would say are mundane issues. Um, things that are alien to, to, to this part of the world. Uh, reality shows, for instance, involving uh, people living together in homes, companies, the private sector would throw a lot of money into that, but they would not put money into commercializing research findings. Why do you think it's like that? Yeah, I think uh, there are several issues to this, to, to, to this. One, you know, the willingness of people, especially uh, if you are talking of organized private sector, that is, we are talking about, you know, the companies that, you know, uh, have been, that were developed for the profit making. Uh, such people, you know, they look at or what can they, how can they get quick profits, not looking at the long-term investments. Okay, and let me tell you, for instance, even seeds, which is the fundamental way it comes to agriculture, you find that uh, our sister institute, uh, IR, Institute for Agricultural uh, Research, they have developed several improved seeds. But these seeds are still there as breeder seeds. And some of the seed companies are yet to go and pick those seeds to go and multiply them and sell them to the farmers. So the, 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 the lack of willingness of the private sector to invest in agriculture is quite a very disturbing phenomenon. And I think this has to be changed. We, we, we need to perhaps, you know, uh, government has to lead in this by bringing in the stakeholders to look at what is the problem. Let, let, us, let us really do something different from what we have been doing to see concretely 
how we can bring in people to invest. Because I'm telling you that uh, agriculture, wherever value chain have taken, uh, can give you a lot of profits. A lot of profit because Nigeria has a huge market with the population, with the resources that Nigeria has. God has the resources that Nigeria. God has endowed it with. Uh, there is a lot of potential, you know, when it comes to investment into agriculture by individuals. They, they, they can they can actually make a lot of money. Right. Inputs again. You talked about seeds. Yeah. Let's talk about the access to some of these inputs, seeds, fertilizers. And I, I want us to keep in mind yeah. something you just said, that even having access to, uh, to fertilizer, for instance, uh, does not guarantee that uh, uh, the farmer knows how to apply the fertilizer correctly. Yeah. Same thing, you have seeds and uh, access to the seeds, one issue, and how and what to do with those with seeds, the seeds. Yes. another issue. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Yes, so you see, uh, like I mentioned, you see, uh, seed is not perhaps different from any other grain, except that the way it was produced as seed. So many farmers may not know this is grain, this is seed, except if it is a, grain, a seed that has been treated, then you can see, yes, you know, it has been packaged. So, uh, like I mentioned, uh, there has been you know, lack of willingness of even the seed companies to take in this seed from, from the breeders and, and multiply them, and they make them available to farmers. Secondly, you see, uh, most of these people that are selling seeds, some of them are just marketers. They, they don't really have the agronomic knowledge of how these seeds can be used and things like that. So th this is one issue. And that if perhaps after I take in maybe the major seed producers, I mean major seed companies, you find that most of the small seed companies, they are just you know involving the marketers who, who just tell you this and that, but they are not really experts and uh, or, or to know that okay this and so on. And then thirdly, we need to have what's called demonstration plots, so that this seed can be demonstrated to the farmers. And the cost of this demonstration plot should be borne by, by, by the seed company. But most of these companies don't. So, farmers are, you know, in, in, in a dilemma. Whether when somebody has told them that this seed is good, is good, it can give you this yield and so on, whether it's correct or not. But supposing some of these companies can go into, you know, demonstration, to, to demonstrate to, for the farmers to say, yes, this seed that we have said, is producing, look at how it is producing. Then you find that, you see, it will create, you know, it's also an, another extension services and it will create awareness to the, to the farmers. So how have you helped in uh, improving access to these inputs and providing the needed knowledge uh, to the farming population on what to do, yeah. how to go about using yes. these inputs? With our adopted villages, any village that we have taken as an adopted village, we actually, you know, uh, go into whole hog from the planting to the harvesting. Everything using improved, you know, technology, improved practice, and it, it, that includes seeds, patlada, and things like that. And we, we continue to do that. That is why today, uh, many villages are coming to us without even we going to them. In fact, they are almost trying to overstretch us. Because uh, uh, on weekly basis, we have application from villages asking us that they want to be part of our villages. So that's one. And secondly, for others who are not at the villages, we have, you know, several publications. We have bulletin, we have guides, we have also, you know, uh, uh, we have radio programs, you know, we have television programs that we have been airing uh, to people who listen to them. We also have uh, the, the farmer table, like I mentioned, uh, he, he has already come on board. Presently, we are test running it, and, and the number is there. So uh, people who call us also get services of this of, 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 of extension service from us. Uh, I can easily give you the number. The number is 0813-0813-980-090. Let me repeat, 
0813-980090. This is our Palmer's Helpline Center number uh, that once you call during the working period, we will listen to you, we will also give you advice. By the way, Prof, um, if the private sector would not do anything about uh, commercializing research findings, are they also uh, participating or not participating in uh, provision of extension services? And if they are, who regulates their activities? Good. Uh, well, you see there are different categories of private sector. Mm -hmm. You have the NGOs, like SG2000, IFRI, and so on. These are, you know, private sectors that are also into agriculture, into also extension services, you know, with different projects, partnering with different, you know, uh, governments, state governments, and the National Agricultural Research Institute to go into extension services and provide support. Right. Then the other category, perhaps you are referring to, is, you know, a company that has been established as a private company that want to go that you that is going into agriculture or extension uh, uh, to make profits right uh, presently I cannot just tell you there's one particular private sector that I know that is into extension for profit making All right. so uh, and that's one issue but the other category mm -hmm. is the issue of farmers to say being private people right going to so NNLS has actually you know uh, currently you know, uh, developing that sector okay. of farmers becoming private farmers, private uh, extension advisors. Okay. And I'm happy to inform you that NLS have won a grant of over one million dollar to establish what we call community-based advisors under Agra projects in Kaduna and Niger State. Mm. And uh, and and that grant came this year. We are starting. And we're targeting 360,000 farmers in two states. Right. In the first year, we're targeting 180,000 to, to, to increase their productivity and produce the extent, the, the community based advisors. It's in Niger and, and Kaduna, Kaduna states. Kaduna states. Yes. Okay. All right. So it brings us to the question now that we always hear yeah. aging farming population. Thank you very much. Is it still an aging farming population? In the question of creation of jobs, lots and lots of young people, are they seeing agriculture as different now? Not the drudgery of the past, where the image of the farmer is a hoe and a cutlass. Thank you very much. Uh, unfortunately, Mutasiri, I must tell you that the average age of a farmer in Nigeria is still about 48 years. And what it means is that the majority of the farmers in Nigeria are still very old. And people who are farmers in Nigeria are between, you know, 40% and below are less than 10% of the, of the farming population. And this is because of the issue of drudgery that unfortunately is still there. Uh, that is why uh, I think this very government, this government, fortunately, it, it has gotten another second term. We hope that it will continue with what it has started, bringing in use into 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 agriculture. Like I mentioned earlier, there has been a deliberate effort of empowering youth and women into agriculture. So. The first agenda that should be is one, sensitize the youth into agriculture. Let them look at agriculture as a business. Rather than, you know, holding your chance of certificate, moving from one town to another, looking for a job, white collar job. It's better to sit down in a rural area and take agriculture as a business. Second, uh, we must also, deliberately as a nation, increase the level of mechanization. One, mechanization increases efficiency in agriculture. It, it takes away the drudgery. 
unfortunately we are still lagging behind but it's not it's not too late and i hope and i pray that uh the 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 the, the new coming or the next level of uh president buhari should deliberately increase agricultural mechanization to the extent that it will make agriculture to be attractive nobody really wants to go to farm and bend down with a hoe and and and, and, and farm and weed because if he does that he will not produce food for more than five people but with level of mechanization being increased one farmer can produce food for 1000 people and that means his productivity has been increased and that goes along with the income so this is one area that i believe not only the federal government even the state government should actually you know focus on uh, uh, if we are really talking about agriculture as a mainstay of the economy right that's as far as the buhari administration in second term is concerned what do you expect to come out of them but what do we expect from naerls as you move forward in terms of all the things you have listed here that you've been able to do in projecting extension and uh, how important it is to food security what do we see of this uh, institute of yours thank you very much uh, the first vision I have is to make this farmers helpline and small helpline centers become very effective because this farmers helpline and the zonal helpline they also you know includes uh, audiovisual training video conferencing facilities why by farmers in their locality as long as there's internet service can be trained from the center and they also include you know uh, uh, sending video messages to the center and the center can also reach out to 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 to, to experts in addition to the fact that the center has a knowledge base that is robust and is always been updated with latest information but the center also has a provision to reach out to experts, not only in Nigeria, any other place, to get relevant technology and pass it. The center can also be at a platform for, 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 for government or for any you know, uh, uh, development agency that wants to speak to, to the farmers you know, at a personal level. Because the center can send bulk SMS such that a farmer may not really read it at that time. May allow it maybe when he's relaxed and he read it. And the center also had the capacity for now to, to utilize three major languages, mm -hmm. Hausa, Yoruba, and Igbo. So uh, that is my first uh, vision for this in the next one year. I hope this should, should be a reality. And mm -hmm. the second thing that I also want is uh, what has started, especially on the issue of extension. We need to really address that issue, especially at state level. Uh, already, you know, Augustus government has, you know, made uh, uh, agriculture as an, uh, as, a, as an emergency issue. So let's create a state of emergency for agriculture at, at the federal level. We need to do that if we really want to achieve food security as I've been talking about. Mm. This country has the capacity to, to produce food for, this, for the whole of Africa. But unfortunately, we are here not being able to produce food for enough for ourselves. So, and, 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 and all the potential and everything that can make us to do it is there. So why can't we make it? All right. So many issues to talk about, extension, agricultural extension, food security. But uh, we'll have to leave this conversation here. And uh, thank you very much. And say, we hope to ask you to come again uh, to see what further inroads you've been able to make into um, improving productivity, agricultural productivity in Nigeria. So, but for now, uh, Professor Mohammed Khalid Othman, uh, Executive Director and Chief Executive Officer of the National Agricultural Extension and Research Liaison Services of uh, uh, Ahmed Dubildo University, Zari, which is, of course, the NEARLS is one of the bodies, the organs, the institutes being supervised by the
uh, Federal Ministry of Agriculture and Rural Development. And also a university, because it's under Ahmed Bell University. Okay, right. <laughs> so, so we thank you very much thank for very much. coming yeah. on one-on-one. -on -one. Yeah. We hope to see you again. Soon. Thank you very much. All right. It is a pleasure. Okay. <laughs> All right. And uh, that's our program today. We thank you for being with us. Next week, we'll reach you again on one-on-one. -on -one. I am Cyril Stover. Bye for now. Thank <laughs> you.